Welcome to Innovation in Government from the West 2024 Conference, hosted by AFSEA International and the U.S. Naval Institute, presented by Kerasoft. I'm your host, Francis Rose. Over the next hour, you'll meet leaders in government and industry who are at the front lines of data management, artificial intelligence, large language models, and more in the sea services. Leaders from the Coast Guard, Marine Corps Systems Command, the Office of the CNO, Marine Corps Forces Cyber Command, and U.S. Space Command will be here. One great theme of this conference is readiness. The question that usually follows is ready for what? Vice Admiral Andrew Tongson is commander of the Pacific Area and commander of Defense Force West for the U.S. Coast Guard. At West 2024, he tells me what's changed in his area of responsibility since I talked to him at West last year. That a lot of things have changed since the last time we've met. First, uh, I have had the opportunity to go throughout the AOR to listen to our partners firsthand, to see the threats and challenges through their eyes in order to meet them where they are with what they want. That is extremely valuable to us. Secondly, uh, we at U.S. Coast Guard Pacific Area have constructed our campaigning approach uh, to get after these threats and challenges. And we've codified all this, and we are implementing as we speak all of the operations, activities, and investments that can help move the dial on our strategic objectives moving forward. And finally, I'd like to mess, uh, note that we, like the other services, are having difficulties with recruitment and retention. And this is putting a strain on our operations here at home, our operations abroad, uh, and our workforce, most importantly, our workforce. And the Commandant and our Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard have taken great action to go ahead and say, hey, we are not going to do more with less. Uh, we have curtailed some of our operations and we are being more strategic about where we assign people as well. So those three things have clearly changed and have made a difference in the past year. But you've had a chance to get around your command and, and as you said, have people tell you what they want, what they need. What's the common theme or themes that you're hearing among those things? What are people saying over and over again, we need this, we would like to have that? So I would say it's difficult to go ahead and put uh, one reason against all of the vast Indo-Pacific. Each section of the Indo-Pacific, Oceania, the Eastern Pacific, the Northern Pacific, the Western Pacific, all have different types of requirements in there. So for example, in Oceania, these are some low-lying, small Pacific Island nations. They're worried about climate change. They're worried about sea rise. They ask me, how do we handle mass migrations of people? How do we handle humanitarian assistance, disaster relief? When we go to other places like the Eastern Pacific, they're worried about maritime governance. Think about the drug trade and transnational criminal organizations going ahead and undermining the rule of law in those, in those nations. They're after that particular thing. And I would say that in the Western Pacific, you're worried about things such as maritime governance in total, maritime security, rule of law. We, with our niche kind of mission set, and specifically our broad authorities as a military organization, as a law enforcement organization, as a regulatory organization, as an intel organization, fit in a lot of different ways to help all of those players with, with their concerns. I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. Mm -hmm. Many of the nations and partners that I talk to see that as existential. Think protein security, think economic security, and as we like to say sometimes, economic security is national security. These nations feel extremely threatened by others taking their sovereign uh, fish. Yeah. What has the, uh, the threat landscape, uh, how has that evolved in the year or so since we met last time, sir? Uh, I think there's a lot of things that are happening in contested areas throughout the region. Uh, since the last time we have met, what I have seen in the, I'll call it the Northern Pacific, but really in the Arctic and Bering Sea, is I've seen a great deal of collaboration in terms of exercises between the PRC Navy and the Russian Navy that's happening. And what we do is we try to meet presence with presence. So we'll have cutters that are out there to say, hey, we're looking at you, we see what you're doing, don't bother our fishermen. And by the way, these are our sovereign waters. 
that are over here. Um, and other places that we see is, as you know, well, I think everybody knows what's happening in the Philippines and the islands that are contested. Uh, Sierra Madre, for, for example, of the, the vessel there. Uh, I think that is heating up uh, more and more over time that I've seen and, and watched this evolve. Uh, so we are working very closely with the Philippine Coast Guard in terms of tactics, techniques, and procedures on how we handle maritime governance and security. Well, I think one of the things that people don't know or don't know well enough is the integration that happens, especially in your area of responsibility between the Coast Guard and the Navy and then allies and partners around the world. What's that look like, sir? I think it's as strong as ever. I think, for, for example, our relationship with the Philippine Coast Guard, our relationship with the J Japan Coast Guard, our relationship with Korea Coast Guard is as strong as it's ever been. And we're gonna to continue to do that because there's a lot of things involved in maritime security that involve Coast Guards. Uh, and we should be that interlocutor there. We're the interlocutor there for all of the efforts that Indo PACOM is, is conducting. So you will see often that we have small teams that work for Seven Fleet through our, our four Indo PACOM and definitely our cutters and some of our aircraft as well. Admiral, thanks very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to tell our story. This is great. Thank you, Francis. Coast Guard Vice Admiral Andrew Tongson at West 2024. Connecting tech and acquisition teams to drive speed in the acquisition process is one of the themes here. Marine Corps Systems Command is one of the leaders in that effort. Garong Dave is Cyber Technology Officer for Marine Corps Systems Command. At this conference, he tells me the message he wants people to take away from the theme, Fighting Smart for Force Design. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on uh, Marine Corps Systems Command, uh, where I come from. Uh, Marine Corps Systems Command is the only uh, acquisition command in the, uh, in the Marine Corps. And the job we have is, uh, our mission is to uh, equip and train the Marines with uh, IT and uh, uh, weapon system uh, you know, uh, effectiveness to provide uh, capabilities to our Marines, you know, warfighter, uh, and also to be ready in all domains. Um, the way acquisition works in the uh, Marine Corps is uh, we have a, a, a requirement that is generated by the, the, the warfighter that gets communicated to our office, CDNI, which is uh, Combat Development Integration, which is a Deputy Commandant Three Star. Uh, they would put the requirements together. The money comes from uh, Deputy uh, Commandant for PNR, which is Programs and Resources. Uh, and the acquisition gets the money and the requirement uh, for getting the capability out. Uh, the R&D piece uh, has been worked with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, or McQuill, uh, and uh, that gets uh, brought over to Systems Command, where the System Command uh, takes that requirement and, and resources, uh, works towards the delivery of the product, or We'll work with affiliated PEOs, the Program Executive Office uh, for Land System or the Manpower, uh, you know, uh, Logistics and um, our Business uh, PEO or the Digital. Um, so we work together and deliver a product. Um, so coming back to the, you know, fighting smart, it's a very simple concept, uh, which means that, you know, we want to win the fight in the information warfare domain. How do we do that as a Marine? is, you know, fight smart, uh, fight, you know, uh, 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 you know out, out, out think the adversaries and uh, create an environment which is data centric, uh, where the data is delivered to the lowest possible, you know, level uh, in the Marines. Um, as, as you know, Marines, uh, as individual Marines, as a warfighter, as a warfighting machine. Uh, so we provide a capability to the Marine uh, who has the data information uh, the data center city uh, available to the Marine to make the decision and fight the war. Uh, in order to do the data center city, which requires to move away from hardware-based concept to the software-based, uh, you know, solution uh, or, you know, software-defined solutions, uh, that is what is majorly plays a role. And software-based solutions are um, kind of hard for the acquisition cycle because you know you are in the acquisition cycle, we do have some rule, rules and regulations and you know uh, uh, things from the Congress. 
However, uh, we, we are able to use the other transaction authorities or OTAs uh, and identifying some of the software armories, uh, which is uh, DevSecOps pipelines for the Marines. So we have established uh, a collaboration opportunity with the Army down in Austin using the Create uh, DevSecOps pipeline, where we have today the Marines are actually coding apps, uh, working towards the next generation of having the solution at the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, so the acquisition makes all this possible, providing the capability, providing the right environment, and providing to make sure that training is there. Uh, in the other words, on the Marine side, everything starts again from the Marine. Everything boils down to the Marine uh, as an individual. Uh, we go after uh, fighting the war fighting, you know, information domain is to the talent, through the talent management. So starting out with the talent management, adding the technologies. So now you have Marines, you know, having the capability at the edge who can solve the problems that they face in the real time. Yeah. Uh, so the five, again, the five, you know, fighting smart is all about how we win the war in the information warfare. How have you seen the cyber needs of the warfighter change over time, given the proliferation of data that you just talked about and the proliferation of potential endpoints that need to be secured? Yeah, so good, you know, another good, you know, uh, segue, right? So in order to do that, you always think about having a network modernized in a way to support, you know, your warfighter. And the way the network works is that it's it's never the same. Because if, if you are, an, you know, uh, idle, you know, status quo, uh, we think it's a, it's our enemy to be a status quo. So we are looking at constantly as a new technologies uh, that feeds into the, you know, getting the network modernized. Uh, in order to do that, we leverage cloud-based, you know, services, uh, which are really a uh, game changer for the Marine Corps because now we have a compute and storage power that you never had before you run those you know, hard simulations or scenarios or wargaming scenarios and provide the information at the edge. You know, eventually we would like the Marine to have that capability you know, at the edge. We do have some solution that allows Marine to do that. Uh, unfortunately, they cannot do all that compute power right now because again, at the same time, we are looking Marine to be more lightweight uh, so they can maneuver in any you know, place you know, they need to be. Uh, so we are providing that compute power through cloud-based systems and providing the data the Marine needs to make the decision, informed decisions. Uh, so coming back to uh, cybersecurity, because all this data, you know, data center cities, all about making the data available to the Marine. Um, it all comes down to the, how secure your data is going to be and uh, how cybersecurity is applied to. Because worst thing you want to do is to have an adversary to take over your data. So cybersecurity plays a major role there. Um, in order to do that, you know, we look for new opportunities, such as uh, having a you know, network that is more intelligent, that such that it would, you know, um, it would reflect, you know, it would adapt to your new condition based on your situation, just like a, you know, adaptable living organism, right? So with using uh, new technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you can apply that technology based on the need that machine makes the decision good enough that you have the alternate options. You know, so a lot of uh, you know, challenges, as you know, in the world, uh, but cybersecurity will play a major role as cyber warfare is another domain that is important you know, in, in, the, in the world. Garong, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks for your time today. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Garong Dave of Marine Corps Systems Command at West 2024. The discussion around innovations evolving in the sea service space, it includes technology, but it involves other components too. Matt Jones is CEO of Sigma Defense Systems. He sees innovation in a number of places in the sea services. You bet. I think connectivity is really something that's really important moving forward. When you think about operators today, recruiting challenges. Everybody's growing up digitally native now. And they come in and they get to a system and the system has bandwidth challenges. You can't connect, you're not getting the data. It's not the right data to the right place at the right time. We really see connectivity as a place that uh, innovation is gonna be really important and really data strategy as part of that. You need to have the right data moving over these, over these challenge links 
and, and get it to the right places for decision making. Yeah, the right place at the right time for the data is something that just about everybody here is talking about, not just industry, but the people from DISA talked about it in the DISA theater, uh, all of, all of those folks talking about that. Does that mean the same thing to everybody? Is everybody thinking about data, right place, right time in the same way? That's a great question. I, I think that they are, but I think there's a lot of focus right now on standard standardization of data. And you know, when you think about that, that really becomes, especially in the way the, the government buys sometimes, can be very bureaucratic. And really what you want to do is not be so concerned about does this data look like that data? You want to just make sure that the operators and the warfighters get the data. And I think sometimes the focus gets placed in the wrong areas. For sure, I think everybody knows what data. The question is, is the data aligned in the way people want? And that's where you see a lot of segmentation. So one area where data is important in that way is in CJAD C2. They added the C to indicate uh, the partnerships with their uh, with the United States allies around the world and so on. What challenge does that present regarding standardization and the exchange of data? So I think that the, the JADC2, CJADC2 thesis is, is spot on. But if you think about it, it really is kind of like boiling the ocean, right? The government is, the way that we buy, we have program offices that are responsible for comms, program offices that are responsible for a analytics, program offices that are responsible for platforms, and, and those program offices are not always coordinated. And so you end up buying something that doesn't work with something that can't run on something or doesn't fit on a platform. So I, I think the challenge just gets bigger and bigger as you bring in the mission partner environment. Mm -hmm. For sure, we think that you know, there's, there's got to be a look at security levels of data and what can we share, what can't we share. Clearly, I think uh, as, a, as, a, as the DoD is starting to lean a lot more forward in that, and we're seeing a lot more mission success as we lean forward and don't keep everything behind closed doors. But you know, that, that, you're right, that has to be a really important part of the data strategy. Is the department getting better, in your view, at being aware of what all it's getting so that it can put those puzzle pieces together in the way that you described in a better way, know that it will all fit together? I think for sure they're, they're getting better. But, but I think you got to think about where it was starting from. And at the speed we need to move, uh, the reality is we need to go much further, much faster. Uh, I, I'm hoping that you know, we see the right people in the right roles with the right approaches and, and that can really accelerate. I have no doubt that we will catch up as a nation, but for sure that's a, that's a challenge today, is making sure that everything is integrated and plugged in and, and working together. What's the opportunity? What could the department do to plug that together faster? I think one of the challenges right now also around you know, how we buy is small companies are innovating, right? That's where your innovation comes from. Big companies are scaling. And, and so you have this dearth of medium-sized companies in our space. And it, and it really is like, how do we, how do we incense mid-sized companies to really be the ambassadors to take small company technology and grow with the government to scale it? You know, big companies have a have a fiduciary responsible responsibility to their shareholders. Small businesses have a hard time, you know, actually scaling it. It really we need to get back to looking at comparative advantage. What are what are each company's sizes? Why are they doing what they're doing? And how do we reward the mid-sized companies who can really grow with the mission? With the side benefit of growing the defense industrial base, creating more competition for the department. I Absolutely. Imagine. Absolutely. You know, it's an interesting thing. I, I think sometimes. If, if a mid-sized company was to bid the next uh, you know, naval ship, immediately the government would say they can't scale, they can't do it. But if it's something very innovative, right, the, the government doesn't look at that and say, you know what, the big company is the scale player. They don't really specialize in innovation. And so we gotta, it's all about acquisition process and how money flows and who, and who wins the work and, and doing it in a strategic way. Matt, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Matt Jones of Sigma Defense Systems. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are driving a lot of the innovation discussion at the Navy and Marine Corps and on the show floor here. Matt Schmidt is Mission Account Manager for U.S. Navy and Marine Corps at ServiceNow. At West 2024, I ask him how the Navy and Marine Corps should avoid the buzzword mentality for AI and ML and focus on solving problems. So I think the, the biggest thing I have uh, in talking with folks in the services side of the house is what are they trying to solve? What is the, what is the purpose of it? You know, I said, AI, you know, machine learning is a tool. What are you trying to solve with that tool? How are you trying to get it? So when we talk at, from ServiceNow, it's getting to decisions faster, being able to take those decisions, being able to collect those large language models and being able to pull it back 
and saying, here's how you can get your information faster. You have better data points, better ways to get to those decisions, but also a, a way to synopsize to be able to share that information. And that's where we see is a key for folks. Um, like I said, you're going to have a ton of folks out there with a ton of data. How do you parse through it? How do you make sure that the data you're getting is able to be used across the folks, able to be used across it, and being able to have it in a consumable manner that works for folks? And that's right. what we're seeing the real advantage of it. I think that's the wrinkle that I'm seeing here that I haven't seen previously, which is a lot of folks have been talking for years about how data feeds AI and the importance of it to the execution of the algorithms. I think this is the first time at this conference that I'm hearing people talking about the reverse of that in the ways that AI can shape the data and can make sure the data is diffused and dispersed in the way that it needs to be done. Am I on the right track? Here? You're absolutely on the right track. I mean, it's the same thing we, you know, we talked 10, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago on cloud. Everyone had cloud as a big buzzword. What does cloud mean? And it takes a while to figure that out. As I said, cloud means multiple different things to multiple different people. AI can mean multiple different things to multiple different people. But the way you can parse that data, the way you can bring it in for folks to be ingestible, usable, and be able to get out into the things to actually get outcomes that people need and require is huge. And that's, that's the focus you're starting to see is that shift from the general, this is a really neat concept to how do we actually use it? And that'll be the key. What are the potential risks that people at an event like this in the sea services or other military services should be thinking about? Overpromising and under delivering. That's, that's the worst thing you can do with our warfighter. Like I said, you need to be able to say, this is what we can do. This is how we think it can help you. Does this work for you in the use case that you need? Because the worst thing you want is a warfighter going out there and they're out there you know, doing what they're doing out into the, in theater and out into the field about and not knowing that what they were promised can be done, can't be done. You know, I said, we have, we have discussions with folks all the time and saying, here's where our skill set is. Here's where we really sort of specialize in. Here's where we're working. And we know we can deliver that thing. And then being able to you're dependable to be able to deliver that things means all the world to the warfighter. So it seems to me the key of that too is you've talked about focusing on the use case because there are a lot of people here talking about use cases that seem pretty fantastic, that seem pretty out there. Um, but also plausible once you drill down into them. So I imagine staying focused on that use case is the only way to keep kind of guardrails around that from just going completely. It's the key. Like I said, scope creep will get you every time. So yeah. being able to talk to folks and say, what is your use case? What outcome do you need to get to? If I understand the outcome, then I can go back and say, this is where I can help you on that outcome. Here's what I need from you to reach that outcome. If neither of those two match up, then it's not gonna, we're not gonna get the outcome we want. So being able to articulate what do you want from that outcome and where we can actually help in that outcome to be able to move forward to get a clear vision. As you talk to folks in the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, the other sea services, uh, how are they doing at doing that? Are they staying on track and, and able to stay focused on use cases or does that scope creep? I think, I think it depends on who you talk to. As I said, each echelon command does things differently. Each area does it separate. But when you really look at it, it's like the folks that have a clear vision of where they want to get to, it's no problem. Um, the folks that are dealing in what I say more of an ambiguous space where they're trying to figure out, I'm trying to solve a really hard problem, th that's more of a skunk work. That's more of an area that you've got to be able to say, okay, we need to leave a little wiggle room to be able to handle that piece of it. But it changes based on the folks. I mean, again, the key is, as I said, you've got some phenomenal leaders out there. You've got some phenomenal groups and how they sort of set the vision that they want to accomplish and what are those pillars that they want to work to and then being aligned to those pillars. It's great to talk to you, Matt. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Matt Schmidt of ServiceNow at West 2024. This event features a number of sea service leaders in new roles. One of them's Navy Rear Admiral Tracy Hines. I talked to her last year at West in her last assignment as director of the Navy Cybersecurity Division in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. Now she's deputy director for information warfare at US Space Command. Here she tells me about her new roles and responsibilities. So I am the Deputy J3 um, for Operations for Global Space at uh, U.S. Space Command. I got there in August, and let me tell you, one of the things that we say is there's never a day without space. Mm -hmm. So in charge as the Deputy J3, we do everything from global sensor management. We do current ops. We do future ops. We have a whole area where we're looking at space domain awareness. We uh, have, a, an, a, a, of course, we got a, a big planning effort that we do 
in space. We have a joint operations center that's a 24 seven watch. So I'm a deputy that oversees the operation of that because they're looking at all things space. They're looking at launches. They're looking at re-entries. They're looking at threats. They're looking at conjunctions. So um, it's the world of operations, but instead of, you know, on the maritime front, I'm now looking up yeah. and that's what makes this so fascinating. Um, we also have an area now that we call it our joint cyber center. So there's some defense cyber operations. There's some uh, offensive cyber operations, of course, applying it to space. Mm -hmm. So I think what's great about it for me being an information warfare officer working in space as I was a member of the space cadre. But now the perspective that I bring to it is, is still from that war fighting aspect. Yeah. But now I'm just looking up and let me tell you, there's a whole lot going on up in space. I want to talk about some of the numbers that you brought, but I'm curious how your information warfare background informs the way that you're doing your job now and what that adds to the mix of what's happening in Space Command. Absolutely. So as an information warfare officer, I was also a part of the space cadre. So I knew enough about space to be a little dangerous. <laughs> well, we know that the fight is probably, it's already started in a non-kinetic mm -hmm. um, realm. So having that non-kinetic essay and understanding on the tools and things that we need, the situational awareness that we need, the common operational picture that we need, now is just applying that to space. So I think having that technical understanding of, well, you know, we gotta be left of things. I think um, when I talked cyber, I talked about, you know, the frustration of not being able to look at those precursor behaviors and anomalies. Well, we still have that same challenge. But as an information warfare officer, it's, it's those things that are not, they're unseen. Mm -hmm. It's those little things that happen that we need to be more left of boom on. So I apply that warfighting principle to the things that I'm learning and doing in space. And I think that's what helps complement it. Um, and I bring a, a whole different perspective to things. I work with a lot of Space Force, work with a lot of Air Force. Of course, we have Army, we have Marines. So I think together, that's what makes that whole joint pot, looking at things uh, you know, from a, a different um, perspective, bringing it together so that we can truly be um, at the ready yes. and uh, ready to fight tonight. All right, you brought a prop. So you have some, you, you have some graphics there to, to share. Well, you know, the thing is, is, because a lot of these stats are amazing to me, uh -huh. we've had over 24 conjunctions this year. So conjunctions are, you know, when things, you know, get really close and, and, and make a mess in space. Yes. Well, there's been, um, um, for six of those, we've actually had to move the international space system. Mm -hmm. So that we have that ability, but, and we can see things coming and then make that assessment when we need to, to move things out. Mm -hmm. um, there's also probably almost 3000 satellites cataloged. That's cataloged. Wow. And of course, you know, there's different earth orbits where we have things at, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the Pelio all the way up you know, to Hio. Um, there's also been 1,978 missile launches. Wow. And I think everybody's, you know, tracking yes. tracking that as that happens. Um, there's also been 25, 257 re-entries. And we care about the re-entries because where are they going to fall? Where are they going to land? What mess are they going to make? And what are the other disturbances that are going to take place? And then there's also been 212 space launches. So... Um, our tagline is never day without space yes. and we need to deliver space capabilities to the joint force to be active campaigning to deter and be ready to fight and win mm -hmm. in space. So with all that going on, um, we definitely need to have that great situational awareness so that we can make those rapid decisions. Mm -hmm. I love the way CNO um, framed everything yesterday. She said war fighting. She said war fighters and she said foundation. So as I apply that to space, we're in the fight already. I talked about that non-kinetic piece yes. and we are the war fighters at a combatant command. Oftentimes people get confused with space force and space command, but well, we are a combatant command that is in the fight. Mm -hmm. So, and we have a space force that of course does the man train and equip just like the Navy or any other service. That's the service component. But this combatant command, of course, we're about four years old. We're four years old. It will be five um, the end of this year. Um, so now we have matured. Uh, General Whiting is at the helm, the helm and uh, he's crystal clear in, in where we're going and, and just the, you know, the warfighting prowess that we bring to the fight. 
Admiral Hines, final thought. What do you see your portfolio looking like a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? What's the evolution look like uh, as, as the command matures and as the other work that you're doing matures? No, that's a great question, too, because... Um it's the opportunities are just limitless. I will tell you, we also have a Navy space element. Mm -hmm. So that's run by um, Vice Admiral Clapperton, who also wears several others, other hats. So we have a Navy space, we have a Marine space. So I think bringing all those together as, as we mature and really um, getting that other service um, essay on how we can be even stronger. I, I, I think, you know, being a part of ops and just not in the information warfare, um, I have actually sat in the meetings um, for the uh, J3 actual at times. So I think now when I go to another combatant command, I will bring that stronger space element to, 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 the, to the fight. But I, I think um, now um, we'll get better situational awareness. We will be more at the ready in space. We will um, probably mature the C2 lines because a lot of times when people talk about, well, you're, you're, my AOR is 100 kilometers uh, above sea level, yeah. right? So that's a huge AOR. But what about when something happens in Indo-PACOM? What about when something happens in UCOM or CENTCOM? But it's all still up there. There's a combatant commander that's in that area, but we're space calm. So there's some C2 lanes, I think, in lines that we will be uh, maturing on, like who's supporting and who's supported. So that's where I see us going, just getting more understanding of how we're all going to work together as, as Space Command matures and gets ready for the space fight. Admiral Hines, it's great to talk to you again. Thanks for your time today. You as well. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Rear Admiral Tracy Hines of U.S. Space Command. Military leaders here mention collaboration as a big value they get out of coming to events like West. Michelle Wolford is Navy, Marine Corps, and Fourth Estate Account Director for Adobe. At West 2024, I asked her about the most important elements of collaboration between government and industry. Say, you know, being here at FCO West is definitely a great place to collaborate. It's, um, you know, multiple times throughout the year, it's a chance for our industry partners to actually meet with military to see how we can help with any mission objectives that are coming out. A central theme that we're really seeing here today is around data and the importance of managing it, um, how it's emerging and changing the strategy of the Don. And um, I would say, you know, a way that industry and military can really enhance the data is making sure that they have the right resources. So that comes with collaborating across industry to see what else is coming up that could be helpful for the mission outcomes. Yeah, what are the biggest opportunities that you see for industry to be able to help the military services in the next maybe year, two years, so on? Yeah, so constant evolution of technologies, you know, uh, consistent with all of industry that we're here to present what's up and coming, um, but really how to do that in a secure way. So taking what we've learned across commercial use cases and making sure that it can be applicable to the government and to the military especially. Yeah. What are some of the commercial use cases where there are parallels? I hear a lot of folks talking, saying healthcare is obvious, you know, HHS does a lot of similar things to commercial healthcare providers, those kinds of things. What are some of the parallels in the in the military space and national security space? Yeah, so um, Within Adobe's use cases, you know, we work widely across retail industries. So if you think about a customer journey, that can really relate to a recruitment journey. How do you get the person who, you know, is most interested in joining the Marine Corps, the Navy, and get them the right information so they actually follow through and sign up? Mm -hmm. What are the opportunities that you see for industry to do things for the services that maybe they haven't done in the past or haven't done as much of? And what, what will drive some of those, do you think? Yeah, I think in terms of, you know, driving more innovations and, you know, opportunities to do so just comes along with making sure that we're having those conversations face to face so that we know what exactly is up and coming. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the information that comes out, we don't get until after the fact of, you know, this is the decision of the way forward, but how can we help shape those? What are the people that are coming to you here, you get a chance to talk to folks about the problems that they're having. What are some of those? You mentioned data as one. Are there other issues that people are bringing to you and saying, how can you help me solve this? Security, of course, yeah. is a large one. Zero trust is a key theme for 
you know, most of the projects that's going on within the Navy. So security is definitely a key theme and making sure that the data that you're managing is being protected as well. And that spans across a variety of use cases, really, the security aspect. Yeah. And that marrying security and data together seems to be one of the really hardcore themes of this conference. What does that look like in a mature state? Do we have a sense of that yet? Again, I think that's constantly evolving. Yeah. So it comes with taking the best practices and lessons learned from industry and making sure that it meets the security protocols that are in place. But um, again, making sure that it gets really granular and down to like the data level when it comes to securing information. Mm -hmm. How does one judge success in some of these things? How does one determine at some point we're on the right track or we should probably go in a different direction? Well, for a different direction, of course, if there's different data leaks or anything, that's when you know you've kind of failed at something, yeah. right? So I would say a secure environment is where, you know, you want to keep the status quo because nothing's gone wrong versus thinking in hindsight, how could I have fixed that or improved it? Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Thanks very much for yes, your time. Yes, thank you very much. Michelle Wolford of Adobe. Some of the discussion here is focused on the micro level of information warfare and some on the macro level. Jennifer Edgen is Assistant Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare. She was a speaker on an information warfare panel here. I asked her what she wanted people to take away from that panel. Uh, I'd really like to echo the CNO's uh, message for America's warfighting Navy. Uh, in her visionary document, she calls out information warfare as a critical foundational element for today's fight and the future fight. Uh, so here in the panels, I'm really trying to explore that space a bit deeper and talk about uh, what we're doing today uh, to set us up for uh, tomorrow. You know, one of the things that she talked about on this program was the importance of the warfighter, or the, the people part of all of that. What does that look like from an information warfare perspective? What's the Navy have talent-wise? What does it need more of in your view talent-wise? So when we talk about information warfare, I think of it in three legs. I think of it in people, process, and technology. Technology often gets the most play because it's uh, some of the most tangible. But technology is worthless unless you have fully qualified sailors who are operating it. And we've done a lot of investment uh, with our type commander uh, to really grow that future force. So we have uh, tr uh, training strategies that move us away from traditional models of classroom-based training um, to using things like live virtual constructive. Uh, so people have uh, not just the classroom uh, learning, but also the opportunity to touch, feel, and try out different scenarios uh, ashore. So when they're afloat, uh, they have a variety of tools in their kit bag uh, to face the future challenges. Let me of the uh, the digital native cohort that is being recruited in all the services, not just the Navy. Um, how is that manifesting itself in the way that you bring those people in, what they know and what they need to know in order to be able to fulfill their missions? Right. Uh, so what we're finding with digital natives is some of uh, the traditional time spent in the classroom with some of the underlying um, uh, theory, uh, they come with that. Uh, so this has really caused us to reevaluate our training model. We're spending a lot of time with actually the neuroscience of how people are learning and generational differences with that. Mm -hmm. What's really exciting though is that uh, sailors are arriving with skill sets that we wouldn't even you know, dream of 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's a tremendous opportunity for us to uh, provide a technical foundation that really unleashes the sailors. It unleashes their creativity within a, a set of guideposts uh, so that they can uh, use what they have to the maximum extent. So they get to uh, use the technology, we get to learn from them, and then it's almost like a leapfrog, yeah. a yin and a yang. Yeah, it's, it's something that the Navy has really been in front of for a number of years now in trying to understand the way that sailors learn and how they can most effectively receive the training. What have you learned, do you think, over that time that you're able to put into practice then that, that pays dividends when you're doing the kinds of things that you just described? I'd like to say with a pithy, sum it up with a pithy <laughs> statement of never underestimate the power of the sailor. Yeah. Uh, so if you think about uh, how sailors are learning both professionally and then in their uh, commercial lives, they're using things, uh, the online presences, their knowledge sharing amongst themselves. So 
we shouldn't fight that. We should embrace that because that's another learning channel. Uh, and I think uh, I'd like to highlight uh, the CNO's uh, message associated with the get real, get better uh, efforts. And the, at the heart of that is the mindset, the mindset of always continuously learning. And so we often talk about that in terms of a uh, professional challenge. It's equally important uh, in our, our learning space. How do sailors learn best and offer a variety of channels from uh, that they can engage in uh, across the spectrum. What's the emphasis on training now, whether they have it or need more of it? What do they need to know now in your view? And what do you anticipate those sailors needing to learn as technology continues to evolve? Well, uh, starting with the broad recruiting strategy uh, from uh, Admiral Cheeseman on behalf of the CNO, it's really creating that space where the Navy uh, ha has a diverse set of needs. So what I'm really proud of about our overall recruiting strategy is matching sailors with their aptitudes, their skill sets, uh, and opportunities to expand those and then apply them uh, to our naval uh, situations. Uh, we just have a minute or so left. What you told me before we went on the air that spectrum is something that's really important that you're discussing a fair amount at the show. What about it is important and what's driving that, that import? Well, I'm so glad you brought that up uh, because Spectrum is uh, a, a finite resource. A, good, a colleague of mine said, it's like waterfront property. Uh, and once you uh, inhabit a space, uh, you've got to be very uh, judicious about how you uh, use it in the future. And so if I look at the recently released uh, President's uh, National Spectrum Sharing Strategy, there's a great emphasis on sharing. And while we all share that strategic intent, we can't overlook the very real technical challenges uh, that are part of that decision-making structure. Because uh, oftentimes we frame the problem as an either or. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, we need to uh, frame it as an expanse and how we can use um, some of the recent uh, emerging technologies from the commercial sector about uh, uh, sharing. Uh, the president uh, in his uh, strategy talked about the spectrum, uh, dynamic spectrum sharing moonshot. Uh, that's something that we really want to see come to fruition because it it allows us more maneuver space. But we can't uh, mortgage our current state for that future state. So we're really looking forward to driving that uh, technical discussion moving forward. Jennifer, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Jennifer Edgen of the Office of the CNO, security of data and networks in the defense sector revolves around zero trust now. Michael St. Cross is Senior Director for Federal at Beyond Trust. At West 2024, I ask him about the opportunity for ZT in the sea services and beyond. You know, what's interesting is we, we see just recently in the news, uh, Volt Typhoon, uh, says to put out that critical warning to cease and desist using certain technologies, because again, uh, advanced persistent threats, AKA China, continue to look for footholds on the perimeter, but they're gaining the privilege on the interior. And I think that's where the challenge is, uh, particularly you know, for the naval uh, and defense industry, is where do we prioritize our investments? What are the best challenges to solve? What's the biggest bang for the buck? And I think with the zero trust activities that have been identified by the DOD, the target activities, the uh, first 91 and then the second 61 for the 152 total, a lot of that, the first pillar that's being solved is user, the user pillar, which is identity. But that importance of identity leads to the privilege and privilege compromise is how the adversaries gain the advantage of compromising the confidentiality, compromising the potential integrity and availability of the mission data. So I think that's really what the focus is. Uh, Volt Typhoon, again, was known back in May of last year, targeting Guam and the infrastructure there. Again, probing the perimeter to really get a hold of the center to move laterally. And I think the Zero Trust program has always been about eliminating the possibility of lateral movement. So the, you know, from my perspective, the biggest opportunity, the, the biggest bang for the buck, the biggest security dollar that the missions can spend is on privileged management, not just an administrator, but that's the user side of it, but on the asset, on the endpoints. There's new things we can be doing there that eliminate the ability for local administration to take control of a system, for users that are overprivileged to uh, be a hiding place for a nation state. And that's still the same tactic, technique, and procedure that we're seeing in the news and continually succeeding. So we need to really prioritize that. Um, and then 
what is the highest risk zero trust activity we can be addressing? Um, again, there's 152. Uh, which ones, maybe there's 70 that have privilege across user, assets, applications and workloads, data. And now we have a benefit that really raises the level of security on the interior fortifications. Again, because the perimeter is always going to be noise, there's always going to be compromise, but stopping the lateral movement is the key. Yeah. That term lateral, I think, is really important too, because for a long time, I think people thought about zero trust from a horizontal and vertical perspective. And lateral suggests that it's much more three dimensional than just horizontal and vertical. No, exactly. And, you know, I, I still love the defense in depth concept and that, you know, we get that um, horizontal and uh, vertical, you know, aspects. But the lateral, you know, climbing the ladder, lateral movement isn't just, you know, going left and right. It really is climbing up. And again, the goal of, of me as a, a cyber offensive operator is I want to compromise your privilege control, which is typically active directory in the Department of Defense. And that happens to be the prison that we live in. Uh, because of the exploitability that still exists in our deployments. So that zero trust uh, activity around privilege, section 1.4 of the activities is, I still think, the biggest bang for the buck for industry today. Um, I have about a minute left. How does one go about parsing for his or her organization which of those or which group of those 150 some are the right ones to focus on today? Well, I think that's the, the, the key. Every mission's different. I mean, we have underwater, we have surface, we have air, we have space, terrestrial, and each of those have areas of privilege control. And I think if we prioritize those, we're shutting down that compromise scenario and getting more effective control of our mission and our data. It's great to have you here. Thanks for your time today. Awesome to be here. Thank you. Michael St. Cross of Beyond Trust. Modernization underpins the work a lot of organizations in the C services need to do to achieve the visions their leaders are aiming for. Sherry Thomas is Cyber Technology Officer for Marine Corps Forces Cyberspace Command. He tells me where his command's network is now, where it's coming from, and where it's headed. Um, so the state of the network, uh, it is a lot of disparate networks today. Um, multiple disparate networks is causing a lot of issues. Uh, the data, we cannot see uh, what's going on between uh, forces and the cybersecurity side, we can't protect it. Uh, what we are trying to get to is a unified network, a single network uh, on both the, uh, the nipper and the sipper side uh, that collapses all of these disparate networks. So for example, a tactical edge user downrange in an island chain can see what's going on and then from the enterprise we can control in terms of cybersecurity protections. So hopefully that gets a quick gist of it. Yeah, the, a couple of things that you mentioned there are some of the great themes that are coming out of this conference. First of all, you went to data right away. Uh, the importance of data and the ability to exchange it is one of the themes I'm taking away from this conference. And the other one that you went to is moving that data to the edge, to the tactical edge for the person that's really doing the heavy lifting to be able to access that data. What's the evolution of that look like, both from a tactical perspective, the tools that people are using to do it, and a skill set perspective, what the person at the edge has to be able to do in order to understand that data and then act on it? Sure. Um, we need to first figure out the totality of all the data at the tactical edge doesn't make any sense. There's not enough network for it. Uh, and then what is, based on uh, human uh, behavior, evaluation, analysis, what they need to see at that particular point, right? Not even a commander downrange need to see everything. Just need to see set, uh, certain sets of data to make informed decisions. That's what we need to get to. And then based on that, we divide, the data is gonna be housed in some kind of hardware. Then we need to figure out what that hardware is gonna look like at the tactical edge. And then from that, we need to figure out what the transport pipe is gonna look like. So those are the phases for this. And then, you know, the big data at the enterprise, you're gonna have a lot of data and a lot of how much needs to get distributed, how much do we need to get into sensors downrange, and then how much is gonna come back up. It's a learning, gonna be a learning process. Mm -hmm. You talked about the importance of network modernization, and I think you pretty eloquently explained why it's important. You obviously don't have the luxury of ripping that network out holding off for a period of time until you can build the new one. What does that process look like as you're trying to simultaneously use what you have and build what you need? Correct. 
Um, so we cannot go fully green, uh, green field. And uh, to me, brown field is three layers of brown, right? Uh, it's going to be a lighter brown uh, to a darker brown. Uh, and what that means is that lighter brown is where we're trying to figure out if there's certain components that we're going to get to in terms of AI machine learning or newer technologies. But the darker brown is things that in terms of that network totally is not good. It's a great F and we need to change the whole thing. And those we might get to the green uh, greenfield approach. But as you said, what we're going to do is we're going to successfully build it up, build upon it. So the network modernization strategy is not a whole scale approach. It's going to be iterative. Hey, I'm going to uh, release something in a sprint cycle, 90 days or 180 days, see how it behaves, see how the users interact to it. Uh, and then based on that, build upon the next version of it. Mm -hmm. What have you and your colleagues had to do culturally to get people used to that idea in the Marine Corps? I, I'm not suggesting people aren't receptive to it, but it is different than the way that all of the services have done software and development projects, IT development projects in the past. Sure, uh, it is definitely a learning experience. It's basically uh, technology coming in before or after, soon after the people and how they're recognizing how this thing is working. So it's a man train equipment problem, right? Uh, the Marine Corps has a retention and we're trying to figure out the uh, retainment side of the business. But at the same time, I'm trying to get uh, data and technology literacy across the force too, right? Uh, the newer Marines and the Marines that have been in there, you're not seeing these wholesale changes. You're gonna see um, changes in both software and hardware as it keeps evolving. So you're gonna see, for example, like, like the commercial vendors, quick uh, dot releases or some uh, th smaller changes, but then you won't be able to see, hey, what's that big thing that changed in the network? We have about 30 seconds left. How does one judge the success of a network modernization effort? How do you understand at various points throughout it that you're on the right track? Sure, um, it's basically user feedback. Uh, I rely on the people and what they want in the network, because obviously it's not gonna be a 100% solution, but it's gotta be better than the current state. And so it's basically always uh, feedback and user feedback. So I'm trying to do more of a DevSecOps model, development security operations. Once it's uh, released, what, how are we feeling in terms of the, uh, the user involvement, user experience? Sherry, it's great to have you on. Thanks for your time today. Sherry Thomas of Marine Corps Forces Cyberspace Command. I mentioned Zero Trust a few minutes ago. The Chief Information Officer of the Defense Department, John Sherman, tells me the department is on track to have its Zero Trust implementation complete by fiscal 2027. Jim Coyle is U.S. Public Sector Chief Technology Officer for Lookout. He tells me about the gains the department can make by hitting that implementation goal. Yeah, I think when we take a look at some of uh, some of the challenges that we're facing today, right? Um, you know, there seems to be a struggle of understanding the data uh, that everybody has, right? The types of data, is it a blueprint to an aircraft? Uh, is it a weapon system, right? Or is it, uh, you know, personal identifiable information, right, of, of a, a warfighter? And so when we take a look at, you know, some of those challenges, the opportunity there, right, is that we can sit and talk about how do we protect national security interests, right? Uh, and prevent our adversaries getting a hold of the data, right, that, that we really need to have kept internalized. Mm -hmm. um, and so through implementing a lot of the zero trust methodologies, uh, we actually stand a really good chance of being able to stop, uh, you know, what has become this rampant stealing of highly classified information. When we take a look at China, I used to have a slide uh, a couple of years ago uh, that featured, uh, you know, our, you know, Ford F-150 and, and, you know, our fighter aircraft and, and we placed it against China, right? And they had a lot of very similarities, right? And it's, well, how did they get that? Huh. Right. So, you know, I think when we start really implementing the, these uh, methodologies and we understand the data on top of it, uh, yeah, we can, we can make a real difference. Yeah. What are the steps that you see the department taking? I mean, we, we all know the strategy. We've looked at the strategy. We've seen all 150 some different pieces of it. But what it will be the most effective way to put all those pieces together so that eyeing that 2027 deadline, we can see, OK, the department did these things to get to the end state that they were seeking. 
Yeah, really good question. I think, again, I'm gonna go back to the data, right? We need to, to really kind of focus on understanding that data set on what are we protecting. Once we understand what we're protecting, who's accessing that data, how are they accessing that data, uh, what kind of a device are they accessing that data from? Is it a, a laptop? Is it, uh, you know, in my enclave of, of a trusted protected network? Uh, or is it a mobile device doing flight line operations on an airfield for, you know, fighter uh, aircraft loadout systems, right? Once we have that, we can then better define that methodology of, okay, how do we now start protecting the core uh, data sets that really matter and then build out from there? And then eventually, hey, great, we can get, you know, start eliminating some of the technical debt that we've accumulated over the years uh, and really start putting uh, some movement in a lot of the infrastructure that we've got today. Mm -hmm. Is reducing or eliminating that technical debt a really critical component of getting to a zero trust solution in 27, as the department has said, or is it just a nice residual side effect of getting to, the, to that? Yeah, I, and I think it goes back to that original question, right? Looking at some of the benefits. I think by implementing, looking at a data first strategy, right? And understanding what are my technical controls that I have in place today? Where are my gaps to you know make sure that data is protected? We start to reduce that technical debt and then we gain the benefit of having the additional funding that we can then place in other avenues that we may not have had before. Maybe it's additional, uh, you know, human eyes looking at, you know, logs. Uh, maybe it's more threat hunters looking for adversarial activity within the environment uh, or moving into that continuous monitoring uh, stage, right? Um, and I think, again, that's just the benefits of taking that data-centric approach first. How does one effectively parse all of those various controls and, and so on to determine where that organization should start? Is it mission-focused? Is it infrastructure-focused, what we already have? How, how does one sort through all of that? Yeah, again, I think we need to go back to looking at the data first, right? And I think putting uh, or having the understanding of the types of data that, that we have, the damage to national security, that will help us prioritize where we need to start looking first, and then we can move out from there. Um, and once we have those controls and we understand, okay, this is you know highly classified nuclear data, we have certain controls that are around it, great. Once that's secure, we can then start moving outwards, right? And we can start looking at lesser uh, class, or, you know, I would say a, a lower classification of data, right? Uh, lower damaging to national security, uh, all the way until we have, you know, hey, here's Tuesday's lunch, you know, uh, menu, right? Uh, and then how do we protect that? Yeah. Jim, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Jim Coyle of Lookout. Thanks very much for joining me on the Innovation in Government program from West 2024 in San Diego, presented by Kerasoft. Our thanks to AFSIA International and the U.S. Naval Institute for hosting us at West. If you missed any part of this program, you can watch the show in its entirety on our website at fedgovtoday.com and on the FedGov Today YouTube channel. Don't miss FedGov Today every Sunday morning at 1030 on ABC7 in the D.C. area and on our YouTube channel. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks for watching. Good night.